Can I just start by saying this is completely ridiculous? In the best possible way. <clears throat> We've been doing the director's close up for over a decade, and I cannot remember a night when we had such an incredible array of directing talent here. So, but honestly, if you ever have doubts about the state of cinema today or movies and making movies is hard, and sometimes you go to the theater and it looks like it's it's a bunch of crap in the theater, and you have doubts about the health of movies, I just want to say tonight is proof of how alive and vital cinema is right now. And I can't think of a better group of filmmakers to, to speak to the, the health of where we are um, and truly embodying the independent spirit. So again, thank you. Thinking about, you know, looking at all of your films for this year and I, my mind inevitably tries to, you know, draw links and see see threads and commonalities. And one thing that struck me looking at all of your work, which is incredibly different, and each, each film has its unique vision. But one thing that struck me as similar throughout was a, a like a profound sense of visual beauty in all of your work. There's a there's if you just talk about the visuals of the films, your films are gorgeous, and that's not always the case with independent film. But I feel like. I mean, from the kind of visual austerity of First Reformed to everything that Boots Riley puts on screen in Sorry to Bother You, there's such a range of work, but it's so beautiful. Um, from the greens in Leave No Trace to every frame of, of Barry's film, it's just, there's, there's a real commitment to beauty. So I actually just want to start with that. Maybe, Paul, we could start with you. If you would talk a bit about um, your approach to the visuals of First Reformed. <laughs> um, actually, the answer to that question is all technology. Uh, films, digital films, are very beautiful now at a very low cost. You know, there used to be secrets cinematographers had. And if you wanted Gordy Willis's secrets or James Wong Howe's secrets, you had to hire those men. Now, there are no more secrets. You can get somebody out of NYU, show them a Storaro, show them a uh, Owen Reisman, and they will knock it off. Because most of their work is being done in post anyway. You know, and so you can, with digital technology, you can make a really gorgeous looking film very cheap. And it's an old mindset that says that the cinematographer is standing on the set, you know, arranging all these lights and creating this beautiful tableau. But it's not. You know, he's sitting there with his iPad and uh, all his little digital lights, and they're all being flipped, 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 flip, and then he's doing most of the work in post. <laughs> and that's why films are so good looking now. Technology. <laughs> We, and, we, and, and we don't then need to take the time. You used to spend four or five hours lighting a scene. Now you spend half hour. You can't even get to your trailer anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. okay <laughs> Good. <laughs> I don't believe that because your film, I, I mean, I do believe it, but the, the framing of your film, the composition, the, the world that you create there is so gorgeous. Okay, it's a knockoff. What are you knocking off? And Oh, I'm knocking off slow cinema, you know. Uh, uh, you know, the, the withholding devices. Uh, and, and there's a lot of people here, and when we get to start discussing withholding devices, it'll be my show for the rest of the night. So, <laughs> But anyway, it's, it's, it's all about withholding. You know, how to give the viewer less than he expects and still keep him interested. Okay. Um, Boots, why don't we move down to you, since I, in my mind, you're at the opposite end of the extreme in terms of the visuals of your film. Your film, again, I, th I found it so beautiful, but it's, right, it's just this rich cornucopia of different visual styles. Can, and as a first-time filmmaker, can you talk about how you approached that? Well, I did. I, 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 I did knock off from other stuff, one of them being uh, Paul Schrader's movie, Mishima. Um, there's a scene that I like a lot in my own movie, which is uh, when uh, the second time Cassius uh, sees the golden elevator. And we stole it almost beat for beat from uh, uh, the, the part, the, the temple of the golden pavilion in Mishima. Because um, I figure he probably stole it from somebody else. <laughs> and that's how music works and that's how film works. Um, sometimes 
because there are problems, uh, you know, um, some of really the, the greatest shots in our movie um, came in, in the last minute of like, we can't get this location. Now, you know, we have this other thing. Will this other place work? And, you know, so for instance, what was the uh, power calling suite? I saw the, uh, the, 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 the trail of fluorescent lights in this hallway and realized that was, you know, that in combination with the other uh, uh, reflections that we got off the, the window when, when Cassius is sitting there getting the speech made to him by a fancy suit guy, or well, that's not his name anymore, but Omari Hardwick's character. And, um, you know, those were, were things like that were figured out in like 15 minutes, wow. right? And so there's some skill, well, one, I had an amazing cinematographer, um, at, at Doug Emmett, and uh, great lighting folks. And um, but 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 yeah, there there is there there's about making do with what you have and and figuring out what works and you know I did plan for years. I made made storyboards. I you know you know it's in Oakland. I live there, so I'm like, oh, this will be a great thing. Most of those things didn't work out, <laughs> right? But the the idea, m me having an idea that there was this visual thing that I wanted to do really helped when all the chaos started and I couldn't do any of those things. Um, but I think it was, it's just about a decision of what, what, you know, what do you want to put energy into? With, with, with music, you know, um, there are some producers that are like, it's about the song. I don't care what drum set you're playing on, I don't care what mic you use and things like that. And then there are some, and, and there's, that's really good. You get some great stuff from that. But then there are others that do care what, what, you know, what reverb you're using, and it matters. And maybe in the end, it all doesn't matter, but it matters to the producer of the music, it matters to the director, and it makes you feel good about it, and, and you put some love into there. Deborah, I'd love to hear you talk about doing Leave No Trace, where, um, I mean, I remember the first time I saw the film and just being overwhelmed by those greens when they're in the woods outside of Portland. Uh, how, many, how many dogs did you use? Was that just one dog? Yeah, just one dog. <laughs> <laughs> Good dog, actually. Um, yeah, from, from, from the PD, they, they, they let it, and, and, and the dog only responds to Dutch commands. <laughs> that's, why, that's why he's saying, um, like, sits. And you know, stills and stuff, you know, because uh, he was, you know, trained in, in the Netherlands. Um, but the the, uh, the 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 Fifty Shades of Green, yes, that was yeah. something. Um, you know, there was a time when digital technology didn't handle green well. And it, it, so Paul's point, it's things have really progressed to a point where any palette is is now, you know, something that you could approach mm -hmm. and. I think one of the things that uh, I really did love in the scouting with the DP for this film, Michael McDonough, was we, we were in love with the idea of the depth and the texture, that you'd have these saplings and these ferns in the foreground that it just kept going. It was so deep photographically yeah. to be able to see these planes you know, as they recede into the, back into the tallest trees. And the fact that we could handle the green and that there were that many shades of it and the fact that there would be all that moisture. You know, in Portland, you don't have to ever have a wet down. You've got it. The whole time it rains, but the crew knows how to, how to get you to be able to perform well in the rain. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they know how to do that. They're really adept at it. So that luminosity, that rain, putting that surface on everything. So, we, you know, the place was glowing. It was working for us. And, and there, but then also it gave so much texture so their clothes really were damp. Their boots had wet marks on them. You know, it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I feel that the forest was, you know, giving us so much texture, and, you know, the the, I, I want to say, it was bringing the whole film to this level that it was almost like sensory. Will this be Nat Geo? Will this be too pretty? Mm -hmm. You know, because that that would be, kind right. of devastating. Yeah, <laughs> and but somehow the Portland. That, that grand forest of the Pacific Northwest 
it's not, it can never be too, it's not cute. <laughs> you know? that, that it, it's got its ponderous qualities. It's got its dark silver tones yeah. and its dark blacks. So, you know. Yeah, it was, it was gorgeous. It I mean, held really. us the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Barry, could you talk about kind of the same question? I, I, I mean, I thought in your film, you know, without, there, I mean, it was in no way precious or overdone, but there was just this quality of beauty to every frame where the way you framed people, the, the colors, the way skin was captured, the way the light was, it was just like you're enveloped in the movie in such a beautiful way. And can you tell, was this, I mean, how, how did you, and obviously I know you've worked with James Laxton, your DP on all your films. How, what were your conversations like heading into, heading into this? Uh, it was kind of about uh, a perspective or point of view. You know, we, we knew, one, we couldn't afford to make a movie that replicated what, uh, what New York looked like in 1974. We just didn't have the budget to do that. Um, but we also understood that we weren't making New York as it looked in 1974. We were trying to reflect you know, a 19-year-old girl's memories of what, it, uh, of what it would feel like. And her trying to hold on to and really take possession of those memories, those dreams, uh, memories of nightmares. And so we began from that standpoint. And you know, a 19-year-old girl who's, who's remembering the first time she made love, the first time she realized someone who loved her thought she was beautiful, that's going to skew um, what the city looks and feels like. And so we actually hit on a color palette that was much more saturated than I expected, You know, just following uh, that character. And I think what, what Paul's saying, he's being a little facetious. I think what Paul's, what Paul's saying is true. I went to film school right at the end of shooting everything on a motion, and we didn't realize that you know, the red camera or any of those things, you know, the Alexa would ever exist. And so we trained by shooting on emotion, and he's absolutely right. If you don't know what it's like to set the lights, the color timer, you're gonna learn by, uh, by example, or trial by fire, and you're gonna fuck up you know, the first few films that you make, unless some experienced DP is going to the lab and telling them how to time your film. Whereas now, um, you can basically reprogram these cameras. It's what we do, uh, both Moonlight and Beale Street, you know, the history of cinema um, is rooted in people selling cameras to families to go record their suburban vacations. You know, you know, emotion is not meant to make movies. It just ended up making movies. And those cameras were sold so white families could go on vacation in Disneyland and take pictures of their kids. And those stocks are very limited, and they were designed to reflect white skin. Um, but now with digital tools, we get the camera and we reprogram it from jump. You know? And it's like, no, you're going to prioritize this dark skin, this melanin. And we start from, uh, from that standpoint. And I think um, if you're a young person, Paul's absolutely right. I'm so fucking jealous of y'all, because a lot of this shit is easy. <laughs> if you just take the time to do the research, really live in pre-pro and figure out you know, what you want the movie to look like, and you can boop, 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 you know, program that shit in and only shoot you know, from, from, what, from 7 a.m. to about 11 a.m., take a break, then come back around 3.30, and then shoot till 8. And you're good to go. You ain't got to set up no lights. Um, but but, but it, I was reading about how Alfonso did, uh, did Roma, because both Roma and uh, Cold War are digital films, but they're black and white. And all the sets um, are red. You know, most of the colors on set are red in Roma, because then you, if, you, if you're from an area where you shot on film, you know, oh, when you transfer to black and white, it's about density. And so you choose more uh, denser colors to arrive at a rich color palette in black and white. So I think taking tools from those cinematographers that that, uh, that Paul was mentioning and marrying them to the tools we have now can just open so many doors. Moonlight was made for a budget of a million dollars. There's no way we could have made that movie the way we made it for a million dollars in 1974. It just would have been, we weren't good enough. It would have been impossible. Unless Gordon Willis was shooting the film, then maybe we could have pulled it off, you know? <laughs> Tamara, could you talk about in private life you film, there's a lot of interior, interiors and kind of small, dense apartments and you really capture the texture of what those spaces are like and what was, and it's, again, it's gorgeous. Um, yeah, I mean, beauty is something that I, some, I have a love-hate relationship to with film and um, sometimes I'm really anti-beauty and sometimes I'm really pro-beauty. And sort of finding that balance with your story is, um, I guess, part of the, you know, process of, you know, coming up with your point of view. So, I, in our movie, I, I worked with a cinematographer that I totally love and adore, and his name is Christos Fudoris. He has, I think, uh, freakish 
um, ability to frame that I love that almost looks kind of accidental and off and not perfect. And I was interested in sort of quotidian beauty and imperfection, but uh, the beauty within quotidian. So, um, uh, you know, and you were talking about the textures of the apartments. And so, you know, it's a very specific uh, kind of uh, socioeconomic New York rent stabilized bohemian people apartment. Um, so the, you know, obviously the production design and the kind of vibe of those kind of crowded spaces mixed with his, I don't know how to describe this person's ability to frame, but I'll give you an example of it um, when you're working with the cinematographer. So it's a dumb shot. It's a, it's a, it's a shot of Paul Giamatti. Um, and I said, okay, so it's gonna be a single Paul on the bed. And sort of you turn around and then there's this, and it's a, it's a scene where uh, he's very angry. It's towards the end of the movie. And um, he's, he's uh, staring up the ceiling on a pillow and he's kind of glowering up at the upstairs neighbors who are pounding and he's really angry about it. So the way that my cinematographer framed it, when I swung my head back and saw what he framed, Paul's kind of falling out of the bottom of the frame just like his chin is just kind of off, just in the most perfect way that I never would have thought of it, mm -hmm. putting it there. I would have, a normal person would have had it be much more symmetrical and kind of perfect and more beautiful, but it was just weirdly like falling out of the bottom of a no, frame. I'm, I'm gonna interject. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because again, technology. Uh, we can now shoot at 6K. Uh, we project at 2K. That means we shoot three times, and in some cases four times, more information than we need. That means you can recompose an entire film in the day I. You look at a film like Revenant, you look at a series like I, Robot, those are films that are being recomposed after the fact. The, the compositions are being done. Did you say I, Robot? In, in a D -I Did series. you say Revenant? <laughs> 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 Revenant was shot completely wide. You know, Birdman, Revenant. <laughs> Revenant was shot completely wide open, uh, wide angle lenses. In that way, you, they could have equipment in the shot, they could have whatever, lights in the shot, and then they would just recompose in the, in mm -hmm. the DI. So that's the new world of So I of guess the fact that my cinematographer made that, it was just so stupid <laughs> because I was like, why did you spend all that time losing Paul Giamatti's chin at the bottom of the frame? We could have done that in the post. I mean, like, what are you wasting our time for? You, you, you know what, though? I like to shoot to where there's no choices. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, if you shoot to in a way where there's like, oh, we can figure it out later, you'll spend a lot of time figuring it out and maybe make a bad choice instead of maybe making your bad choice right here and now mm -hmm. where you can't get rid, get rid of that choice later. You know, so I don't, you know, this is my first film, so I don't remember when you didn't have the choice. But I think, you know, from having to deal with digital and music and stuff like that, where you can do every version of a take that you want. You don't want every version of that take. You know, you want to make a decision and be done with it. So I don't know, for mm -hmm. me, I think for some folks, it sounds like And in the heat that. of the moment, it just like with an actor's performance, mm -hmm. they're doing that right then and there, and it has an integrity that you, that the, that the whole kind of atmosphere of the room, everybody working, they, they're in a sort of heat together and they create that frame or they create that line reading or that performance. So I guess I'm a little less modern than him in yeah, that I think, I'm I think, kind of old fashioned I, I, and I, I like it's, this. I think it's all has like this pros and cons. I, I like mixed because I think I'm right in the middle of the, the new school and the old school. And, uh, and so I, I like to protect the frame a lot but I had a moment like that on Moonlight at the very end when Alex Hibbert is looking out at the water. I went and actually racked the exposure to take mm -hmm. it to black because the, the shot goes on for another like 20 seconds. 
and the DP we were wrapped. He's like, why did you do that? You know, I've known him for 15, like 20 years. He's like, we could just do it in post. I was like, no, I want to do it on fucking set. You know, <laughs> that way, that way, there's no way that we can hold the shot, you know, any longer. And then we just cut the shot 30 seconds early anyway, because he doesn't go back into the water. But but sometimes, but that feeling and of it on built set. Built in the fade. Yeah. I did there. it. We, we went to the lens right. and like actually wrapped right. the iris mm -hmm. I see. and took yeah. it to but, black. But you mentioned performances. Performances are not immune to uh, digital technology. I remember Liam Neeson. <laughs> uh, Liam Neeson when he was doing the Star Wars film. And I ran into him and he was very angry at George because he had decided that he was not going to have a pleasant expression on his face in this scene. And he, George kept saying, you know, be happier, look happier. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. George picked up his mouth from another shot and dropped it in <laughs> so that George got the expression he was after, despite Liam's claim and refusal to do it. That's the world we're in in performance, too. It's not just composition. You know, Scorsese is making an entire film uh, in, 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 uh, of performances in post right now. Fake news. Pa Paul and I just saw Welcome to Marwin together, and he's a little heated. That's, that's all. That <laughs> so, Bo, I want to ask you about Eighth Grad. Uh, <laughs> this, this panel is now called Director's Tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on Eighth Grade, Bo, I would like to hear you talk about this same issue. Um, again, like... Uh, De-aging Els Elsie Fisher? <laughs> yeah, right. So she was... I don't it was know. actually a glorious Stuart you cast in that part, so. I don't know, man. I'm a fucking idiot. Any fucking idiots here? I feel like an idiot. Yeah, okay. I'm one of you guys during this conversation. Uh, I don't know, man. I did, you know what? I shot mine 8K and cheated all the time. Digital pushes all over the place, reframing. I mean, it was my first movie. I was giving myself as much uh, help as I could get. And, it, you know, I could have shot it better. No, no. I could have, you know. Okay. <laughs> It's, it could have been a little better. I mean, I don't think the thing shot perfectly at all. Uh, I gave it a shot. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know. Uh, God, I don't know. These, a lot of the films, I mean, these films are better shot than mine. But, like, you know, we tried to get in there, sort of scrappy, play with the medium. We definitely wanted to intentionally make a digital film because it's a digital story, you know. So, like, yeah. we were very happy to... Like, the film opens with footage of a MacBook Pro that's actually de-resed because Mac Pro, MacBook Pros shoot at like 1080, so it's, it's not how I remember, but, um, you know, with horrible digital blocking and a big, ugly digital zoom because, you know, uh, it's just a weird thing in, in this movie in particular where the actual, like, medium of captured digital media is actually really part of the story. So that informed some of the ideas visually, you know, mm -hmm. the flatness of a screen, which is a lot, you know, longer than, you know, the wider lenses. When you put, when you put uh, them next to her, that the, the sort of depth, the z-axis is what you lose in your phone, um, is what she sort of loses when she's uh, filming her YouTube videos. But um, I don't know, our main, con so we were trying to go for, I guess, a sort of digital beauty. And the, the real image to me that I was just trying to capture with the movie, the one image I think of is just, the image of someone on their phone in the dark at night. Because it was, you know, it feels like film has been very technophobic and sees screens as incredibly not cinematic. And to me, like, you know, Barry Lyndon writing a letter by candlelight is the most cinematic thing in the world, but a girl alone on her phone at night, which is the letter and the candle fused Today. together. Yeah. And, and it's actually like the, the cool moonlight is now the close light to her and the warmer candlelight is now the light in the hallway so, so now, hmm. when you shot that yeah that was no other light you just, no that, yeah it was your only source, was yeah it? it was the only source and we had to do a lot of tests with uh, th just shooting the phones to make sure it would register and um and then we just sort of found the little trick in the montage of, of messing with the opacity. And then uh, it kind of gives this weird feeling that's reflected. But with the 8K cameras, you can see the detail of the phone in the reflection in her eye. Wow. And uh, it was very important to not do screen replacements. I mean, that's something that I've really been annoyed with in a lot of things. One, the light on a phone, when you're scrolling through a phone, the light is changing and the light's changing on, on the face. But also the look on your face when you're looking at the internet is not the same as when you're looking at anything else. It, your eyes are doing some tiny little micro movements and it's a blankness on the face that I, it's like every color mixed together making white. You know, it's a, it's a blankness that's full of, 
a lot. So, um, Just out of curiosity. help. Um, no, it's kidding. So, when you use a, a, a screen, a tablet or a, yeah. a laptop as a light source, yeah. is it always realistic or do you program the light source in? You, you definitely go brighter. You turn the brightness up in the screen for sure to. Um, that, like that, the way an actual screen registers to your eye at night is much brighter than what it was. But um, no, I mean, we, we tried to stay pretty natural and native to it. Um, yeah, we didn't, uh, there, there was never really any, any, any cheating of it. But, All uh, our screens were actually paper. Is that right? We just, we didn't wow. have the money to composite <laughs> yeah, everything. Exactly. So we just put paper screens on everything. <laughs> yeah. And then we could, uh, we, we did composite the ones that were right up there. Is that for real? Yeah, no, we oh, really? really just... You had paper over paper. a light? Or what uh, was that? Paper I mean, over no, a light? Nobody looks at that shit. You know, <laughs> uh, so, we, yeah, we, no, like, you're see, when you see them in the telemarketing thing, there's, like, there's, like, there's computers, and they, we just put printed yeah, paper on there. You just did bounce light. No. no he's like, mm -mm. We just put printed paper on the computer <laughs> that looked like the computer was on. The computer was not on. <laughs> I, I just hate when movies, when it's like someone sends a tweet and the tweet is superimposed and then it flies off. It doesn't make any sense to me because like, I do actually think the really emotional value of these things are the fact that they are on a little screen in our hands behind glass. Yeah. There's a significance to that. There's actually, there's a significance to the, like, the tactility of, of our technology, and it isn't just abstract. It isn't just floating around. We don't just in, you know, come into contact with these things as, as just text. Uh, I think part of the reason we fucking hate everything online, because there are these little things in our, they're just these, it's all this little shit in our hand that we're just scrolling <laughs> past, you know what I mean? And it's like, in no particular order, you see your best friend, the president, Costco. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck? You know what I mean? It's just like, and the fact that they're all there is, is uh, significant. I will say a very funny thing is we had to do pickups of, the, of, of inserts of the phone. And uh, in one of the shots when she's texting, it's my thumbs with her, her nail polish on them. <laughs> texting. So it cuts from Elsie's face to my big, because we got a hand double, but actually Elsie and I's thumbs are similarly she shaped. She was like, I cannot do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, no, you didn't. So my giant uh, wow. sausage thumbs are in the movie. Um, just before we leave this thing, I think... Uh, Really, a big part of the, the look of Sorry to Bother You is also the production designer. The yeah. pr you know, like, uh, Jason Kizavarde, our production designer, just did an amazing job and, and made each space, you know, that was the idea, make each space something where we could figure out something that looked really cool. Is he someone you had worked with before, or how, how did you come to work together on this? No, I mean, that was probably the most, like, most of this movie got done by going around agents and, you know, not doing that. And, and, but this was the one an agent uh, referred him, and uh, he had done all that, uh, like, Greasy Strangler and Swiss Army Man. And I was like, this guy's uh, out to lunch. Yeah. Same place I eat at. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask all of you about, um, I'm kind of scared at this point, but um, <laughs> I feel like all of your films in different ways deal with intimacy in, a, in very significant ways. I mean, they're very intimate stories. And again, let me start with Paul. I feel like... The, the entire movie is this, you are alone with Ethan Hawke, you bring us so close into him in this very private world, um, and then with Amanda Seyfried, there's this other form of intimacy that comes in. The scene when they lie together on the floor and press their bodies together is so amazing and so intimate. And I'm just wondering, can you talk, uh, this is not digital trickery, uh, or maybe it is, but um, no, they I'd actually, love to hear you talk they about. Actually levitate. Yeah, yeah, they exactly. did levitate. I'd love to hear like how you, I don't know how, how how you came to that, and also what it was like on the set. Like, what was your set like in terms of creating a space where Ethan could do well, the work I mean, that he did? One of the nice things about independent film is it's a, essentially a kind of cottage industry. You can do your own if you get keep control of your budget. 
You can do your own little thing and be financially responsible and not worry. Uh, you know, it's when you get addicted to the big toys, the extras, the production values, the lo location, that you lose control. But independent film, you, if you're smart and you've been doing it enough, you can remain in control. Now, with uh, First Reform, I've made a number of films over the years where there's two characters. One character is a young man, and the other character is, is his room. Those are the only two characters in the movie. There's a man and a room. Mm -hmm. And that's how I sort of see them. And occasionally other characters will drift in and out. But it's really about the relationship of this human being and this empty room. Um, and that, I guess, is the kind of intimacy you, uh, you referred to. In, in terms of the levitation, I needed, I, I want, at the end of the movie, I knew I was going to jump out of this material world. And I, and I thought, well, you know, I should prefigure that. I should tell the audience that there is a, a non-material world. It's real close to us. You can reach over and you can touch it. It's right there. And how do I tell the audience to be ready for the non-material world? I said, well, um, and I started thinking. I said, well, what would Tarkovsky do? I said, well, Tarkovsky would have them levitate. That's what he did all the time. You get two people horizontal, that's his go-to position, up they come. <laughs> and so, the mirror of sacrifice. So I said, well, I'll just do it. If it's good enough for Tarkovsky, it's good enough for me. I'll just have him levitate. And, uh, and then, of course, I added on to Tarkovsky by doing the, uh, the Bosch in uh, Hieronymus Bosch, Garden of Earthly Delights, where you have a panel from uh, the Edenic panel, you have today's panel, and then you have the horrific uh, underworld panel. And so as they go on their voyage, uh, his mind, which is so deeply corrupted by despair, takes the Edenic voyage into the evil place. Deborah, can you talk? I feel like so you're we're going back to the woods, and you have a father and daughter, and they don't levitate, but they have um, an incredibly intimate relationship. It's very isolated. Um, I mean, Thomasine McKenzie, who plays the daughter, is I had not seen her before. I thought she was a complete revelation, and Ben Foster is great as as ever. How did you get them working? To, what was your what was it like on set? How did you get them to that place? You know. This being an independent film, I'm assuming you didn't have a lot of rehearsal time or, you know, pre-pro for them to spend time together. So how did you create that? We didn't have a lot, but what we did have, we used, they used very uh, intensely with, the, with one another and with the skills trainer who was very charismatic and inspiring to them. And she um, had survived in those same woods for a very extended period of time and brought that, that constituted the rehearsal. They spent time with her learned things from her, then enacted them with one another. Um, they broke bread in the woods, they hung out in the woods, they built, they, they sort of got familiar in their camp and allowed, and then they kind of talked to the production team about where they thought things went. They set up the camp in coordination with, uh, with people doing props and whatnot. And that was and before you were filming. Yes, that, that was, was before, yes. And um, <clears throat> so their, their traction was, was definitely being established and they were, they were doing things in partnership. They were building a survival shelter together. Mm -hmm. um, they were learning how to use their knives. They selected their knives together, and they learned how to use them. So these things were, they were checking with each other. They were actually, as two working actors, they were corresponding you know, in great detail mm -hmm. and exchanging ideas. Um, and then I think you know, there was something that Ben and Tom it wasn't so stated, but they, they did work it out. You know, he, had, he at that point had never been a father. She had a father. She's like, I can, I can, I can show you a lot of what that is. You know? And he was expecting a kid for the, his first child. And I think he, really, he, he was really receptive to being guided by someone who would treat him in this role. And so I think that there, that there was there was a lot of interdependence that was actually real. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got to shoot in order. Oh, wow. Just th so that really, that was the, that was the last part, that, that was the best part of it, I think, for them. So by the time that they are parting, they've gone on an arduous journey together for six weeks, day in, day out. They've gone through all the stages of the story. 
and their parting, you know, Tom has always remarked that the parting meant the end of a very big journey in her, in her young life. Um, it meant the end of a relationship that she had cultivated with Ben and the crew and every, you know, so mm -hmm. there was a lot that had accrued for that scene to have some of its weight. Yeah. So, yeah. Bo, I'm curious how that was for you. Again, I mean, like Deborah, you were working with a younger actor. I mean, such an amazing performance. Um, what was it like on set? Like, how did you come to cast her, and and how did you how did you run the set and get her comfortable? Maybe she didn't need to get. Maybe she just brought that. Yeah. But well, I don't know. I mean, I th I think writing often really fails young actors. I think young actors are often given material that isn't theirs, and they're acted to. They're, they're, they're asked to act like some sort of precocious sort of young poet laureate version of themselves, you know, that, that is vastly more articulate than they ever are. Um, so um, I, I don't know. I was warned a, I was warned a lot, like, you don't want to work with kids. Oh, my God, you're going to work with kids? It's like a nightmare. And I found it to be the exact opposite. You know, the adults were the ones going, like, is this my mark? Like, where's my light? And the kids, I was going, like, spit in your hand. And they were going, which hand? You know, like, it, they were just they were so open and ready to... I did... I grew up doing theater, and I remember really viscerally like being that age and being hungry to participate in the creative process and to own it. And, so, uh, and how many hours a day could you? Nine, work? nine. Well, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's sort of uh, you know, nine hours is about what any actor probably has of good no, acting in them. It, 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 that's wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how 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 old was she? She was uh, f uh, f 13, 14. I, th I, I believe so, Paul. <laughs> I think we have SAG in the house. Can you erase that part? Can you erase that part, please? <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, she spent the first three hours making shoes. No. Uh, uh, no, uh, she... Uh, <laughs> so, um, anyway, what were we talking about? Um, <laughs> Their hand, no one can get into the factory part. Their hands are yeah. small enough. Um, no, uh, uh, I lived right by the Lowell Mills. I know about this, the children that work in the mills. Anyway, oh my God, what am I talking, Paul? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, 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 I, I, the, the, the uh, you know, I, I was worried, no, I know. Uh, the worry was, uh, I went into the, you know, I went into the movie really worried about, uh, who I was going to cast, and thinking that like what I was asking from a kid, no kid would be able to consciously do, and I'm going to have to make like Homeward Bound or Babe, where a kid has no idea what they're doing, and I'm like putting peanut butter in the roof of their mouth and just tricking them into making a film. You know what I mean? Um, and it really wasn't the case with Elsie. Elsie did understand in a way no one else it really. And you realize kids are much more self-aware than they are. That in the very age that they're awkward and painful, they know they're awkward. They know they're in pain. And um, you know, and people would always ask, like, "Oh, was it so weird for her to show her acne? Was she so uncomfortable?" No, she was really uncomfortable in every other aud audition she would go into when she felt like her acne was the thing that was preventing her from getting the job. You know, so like, um, it was just about the set was just about making it safe. I think it would be with any actor, making them feel safe to fail and, and express themselves. And it's the, you know, it's the, it's the big uh, paradox of filmmaking. You budget and plan and schedule to get on the day and capture something spontaneous. And that's all on the actor. So for me, just as me as the kind of whatever director I am, having done one, I mean, like, the actor, she is everything. That, that is all I'm doing. I and mean, I would get caught up in the sort of... Uh, exterior stresses of the production, I would just return to the monitor and see her and be like, this is all I'm really attending to. All I really need to attend to is to make sure that she is truthful and alive and comfortable. Um, and it was a greatest creative joy of my life by a factor of 10 working yeah. with her. I mean, she was just absolutely uh, unbelievable. You know, she's she was playing someone trying to speak the entire time rather than everyone else that was, you know, uh, playing someone that was actively trying to be smaller than they were because they were, you know, psychotically confident kid actors that don't really understand what it means to not want to yeah, speak right. all the time. <laughs> I just, like like Bo was saying, I just let everything go, you know? And so there's no, uh, there's no goal that we're working towards. Uh, I, did have a, I did have a table read for Beale Street. I had a table read. Like three years ago, I had a table read. And I will say, you're absolutely right. We read the whole thing at Center Reach uh, before Plan B, before Moonlight, before any of that. Wow. And the script changed dramatically 
from that table read and became the film that we ultimately made. But yeah, I, I don't rehearse, man. I don't rehearse. And, and, and I don't direct the first take. You know, I like to let the actress go. And then the first take becomes rehearsal. And then I figure out, okay, that's what you think. This is what I think. And let's figure out how to bring these thoughts together, you know? Um, and then really wonderful things happen, you know? Again, I, I think what Bo said is like, for me, and again, every filmmaker, every filmmaker has a different process. Every filmmaker has a different process, but, but you reminded me of this moment on, uh, on Moonlight. <laughs> No, no, you're about to be I'm just eating it. popcorn like an idiot while Barry Jenkins is being like, what that idiot says is better. No, well, <laughs> well because, because Moonlight, there was no rehearsal, and none of the actors could meet. We couldn't afford shit. And so Naomi Harris came in, did all her work in three days. And on one of those days, she's meeting Travante Rose, who's never acted before for the first time. They're doing this huge-ass fucking scene. And I realize, oh, oh my God, I've I got to figure something out. And so now each take becomes a rehearsal, uh, so to speak. Um, and there's this really simple thing where I wanted the scene to be an apology, but I didn't want to write the words I'm sorry into the script. And Naomi Harris doesn't smoke, and so she's trying to light the cigarette and she couldn't do it. And I just said to Travante Rhodes, without, without her hearing, when she can't light the cigarette, take it from her, light it, and give it back to her. And that, that probably would have happened in rehearsal, and we would have written it into the script, and they're both talented enough that they could have then gone and done it on the day. Um, but instead, the thing has to become the thing. And so I told Javante to take her cigarette and light it. And when he did, it just, it was the first time they had touched as, as people, as actors, like period. And in the movie, it's probably the first time they've touched, you know, in years. They're estranged uh, family. And everything just, just came alive. Everything. There were no tears in the scene until that moment. There was no, I'm sorry, those words aren't in the script that Naomi had says. Those all came from this gesture. And I think what Paul, again, I'm, I'm gonna be always the, the, the guy who brings the two sides together. I think what Paul is saying is those things could happen a week before at rehearsal and then you write them into the script and you're guaranteed to get them. Uh, but for me, it's just, um, I, I take the Bo Burnham approach. And on the day, <laughs> I take the Bo Burnham approach, bro. <laughs> and, and on the day, I'm looking, because there's no rehearsal, I'm looking for all that shit. Like the scene between the scene that we showed between Stefan James and Brian Tyree Henry, we only had Brian for one day because he's doing Atlanta. And the cost of getting a guy like Brian in the film is he flies up for Atlanta, from Atlanta for one day and then goes back to work with Donald. And so we're doing the scene with two cameras to make sure we get it. And I realized, oh, you know, in a constructivist prism, you know, the one camera is getting Stefan's energy, the other camera is getting Brian's energy. I'm cutting between them when, we're, when we edit the film. I don't want to cut between the energy, so we kicked. Excuse me, we kicked one camera offset and instead of cutting we started panning the camera back and forth and following the energy um, which is risky because the actors know well all that two camera shit is out the window um, so we only got like four takes of it but the two cameras became now back on you Paul the rehearsal uh, and then we just started following the energy and that became the scene so I think on Underground Railroad we will have rehearsal Amazon is demanding it um, and you guys are recording this shit so you can see that Barry Jenkins has accepted rehearsal time um, <laughs> Boots, I'd love to hear you talk also about the music in your film. I mean, obviously, so before being a filmmaker, you're a musician. How did that inform your, your work on this film and, um, and music and sound design? Well, uh, before we had money or producers for this film, uh, we had the music and the font for the uh, <laughs> titles. <laughs> and uh, so the, the score, was uh, done by Tune Yards, who's a, Merrill, a, a, a couple, Meryl Garbus and Nate Brenner. Uh, they're a band called Tune Yards. And um, I, I connected with them before I went into the Sundance Labs. And we started talking about influences. And, and Meryl is very quick, you know. You say, oh, I'm thinking something like Speria for this thing. And then she'd be like, how about this? And you know, so even when I was shooting, a lot of the stuff that ended up in the movie was stuff that I had when I went into the Sundance Labs and I shot with that. So even more so, I mean, and, and, and but then other things changed, but when uh, there, there were things like, okay, we're pushing down a hallway, what's the music gonna be for this? And we're playing the music at the time. So I, I knew what that was gonna be. Um, the uh, I I had made a soundtrack, so there was there was a a rule that we created, which was the the score 
uh, was the voice of the movie, and the soundtrack was what the characters could hear. Right? And there's only only one um, time when we break that rule, which is like kind of the, the song that happens three times in the movie that's on the soundtrack. But um, so so yeah, like we were working with the script, and and we had. I had a lot of that in my mind. However, when we, uh, you know, when we shot it, things changed, and we changed up a lot of the score, like, but but based on these same things. Um, when I made the first soundtrack was in 2012, <laughs> wow. when I thought that you know, hey, we, I could make this soundtrack and I'll get somebody to make this movie, but uh, that didn't happen. It didn't work. And so by the time we were shooting the movie in 2017, um, that album had been out and stuff, so I knew I needed to create new music. And I had actually, you know, like put it forward to uh, investors, like, hey, here's something we don't have to pay for. I'm gonna be able to make the soundtrack and stuff like that. So we made the, the soundtrack that ends up being on the album, we made that while I was editing the movie, um, so you, and I hated that. And has a new soundtrack come out for the film? Like so, there's a there's two thing there's two albums by the Coup called "Sorry to Bother You." One album is just called "Sorry to Bother You," and one is called "Sorry to Bother You: The Soundtrack," which is very creative <laughs> and stupid. And um, yeah, and and and. Uh, because we put that second one out with Interscope, and they were like, "Well, we gotta make people know it's a thing." But yeah. anyway, <clears throat> it's uh, yeah. So there are two soundtrack. The one is the first one is more just inspired by the script, and the second one is inspired by the actual movie. Because I realized I needed to make things that um, felt like the world that they were in, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, and so that that was hard for me, one because I just didn't have any time. I were, you know, I was in the editing room uh, four days a week for twelve hours a day, and then um, supposedly writing lyrics at night, and then re you know recording the actual music part on the weekends. Um, so it's uh, it, yeah, it became very stressful. Wow. And, uh, it, and 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 but 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 with this the score part that was some, you know those folks they're they're really fucking good and you know like we edit something try to put the thing in that we talked about it didn't work and they'd come with something like an hour later. Hey, can I jump in? Just gotta piggyback. Just, yeah, yeah. Just lightning round question. Now I'm curious, just for all of us up here, because you said 2012 you started this project. And, and now we're here, 2013 for me. I'm curious, just because there's so many of y'all are here, I feel like young people always want it now. That's <laughs> six years, five years for me. I'm curious, Bo, uh, Tamara, Paul, and Deborah, when you guys started your project versus we all obviously are here now. Mm. Uh, in, in my case, not quite quickly, um, I, I uh, had determined never to make a spiritual film. I had written a book about spiritual films um, I had been raised, uh, gone to the seminary, and I said, it's not for me. And then uh, about three years ago, um, I was giving an award at the New York Society of Film Critics to Pavel Pawlowski for his film, Ida, and uh, the Polish nun film. And I, um, he, he had read my book and liked it, and I had liked his movie. And I had to walk uptown to Chelsea that night, about nine blocks in the, in the cold, and in that nine blocks, I said to myself, it is now time to write that script you swore you would never write. You're going to be 70 next year. It is now time for you to write a spiritual movie. And once that intellectual decision was made, it went really quite fast. And within, uh, it was written within a matter of months, and it was shooting in a year and a half. But you know, but that's so much of it is, <laughs> is that you spend your whole life waiting, and so you, somebody says, "How long did it take you to write this script?" I said, "Well, it took about 50 years, and then about 
six weeks after that. <laughs> uh, for this film, producers that had optioned the story came to me, so it was a little different process than originating 100% for myself, and um, and that made it actually a little quicker. Quicker. So I would say I started working on it in maybe 2015. I'm thinking. Seems right. Yeah. 2014, 2015. I was um, 24. I promised myself I would never write a movie about an eighth grader, and then I was walking <laughs> through the Bronx. No. Um, uh, <laughs> um, no t- early 2014, I wrote the script. So, yeah, four, four five years. And, and Ms. Jenkins? I think that um, I always blur it because I just can't face how long everything takes, but then you have those horrible moments when you're in your computer and then you see like, oh my God, that says 2012, or shit, that was the beginning, you know? So I think that, you know, maybe it was 2013, or I, it depends when you call it really starting. You know, there's like embarrassing sort of like notes, and then just those thrown away documents, and then they start accumulating, and then there's a period where you're really working, so there might be a document from like 2000, and what are, where are we now? 18, 19, okay, 19. maybe 2013. Oh, we're in hell, I think. Is what, yeah, where? I actually so started four, writing this in four, four and a half years. Four, four and a half years on average, y'all. For all you people yeah. who want it right now, about four, four and a half years from start to, to screen, so be patient with yourself. That's it, man.